Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Jim Cobray. Okay, so I'm going to get down my knees and pray because I really need God. Thanks, Carrie. Hurry, hurry. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a great, mighty, marvelous, and wonderful time in the word of the Lord today. We haven't come to hear from a man. We have come to hear, Father, from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. Thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts. As you bless us today, we would ask that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics and Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapel and Harvest and Oak Valley. Thank you for the way, the well. We thank you, God, for a Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, Ecclesia Church. God, we bless our Adventist brothers and sisters, and we bless our Catholic brothers and sisters. And no time do we see ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours, almighty God. Be praised in your houses everywhere, and we'll give you the praise. Now, Lord, we have an officer in San Bernardino that's clinging on to life who was shot in the head last week, and we're asking that you would touch and heal Officer Garcia right now, Father, and we call upon you, Holy Spirit, the word of God is a promise that says I am, that we're healed by the stripes of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We stand in the gap for our officer friend and, and, and uh, co-labor. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you for healing him. Everybody say, Amen. amen. Go ahead and take your seat, get your Bible, go with me to Hebrews, the 10th chapter. You know, for some of you, uh, you need to hear this. The Bible refers to itself as the hidden mysteries of God. That's what the Bible says. Now listen closely to what I'm going to say to you. Hidden because they're hard to find, and mysteries because they're hard to figure out. If you ever picked up your Bible, started to read it, and went, oh my goodness, what's being said? And I've said this to a lot of you that haven't heard this because you're new. The hidden mysteries of God tell us how to do life. When you get a hold of what God says, not about what you feel or what I think or some philosophy or ideology of a man, but when you find out what the Word of God has to say and you apply it in your life, all of a sudden the secrets of the heartbeat of God, the very character, nature, and attributes of God come forth and you start walking in the blessings of the Lord. Now, wait a minute. If you don't do that, then who are you going to follow? You're going to follow yourself or somebody else, politicians or economists or whatever, instead of following the things of God. And that's why we're in the house of God we're learning something about the things of the Lord so that we could be what God would have us be. Why? Not only we want to be pleasing to God, but we also want to be blessed in our life, and you know it. So we go line upon line, precept upon precept here in this church. God wrote it that way. You ought to be able to understand it that way. Line upon line means we don't get to skip anything. Line upon line means we're not jumping over and just preaching, you know, our top favorite 20 messages. We have to work at getting into the word of the Lord so that you can get something out of the word of the Lord to apply every day in your life. We don't take that lightly. Today, it's kind of an interesting thing. We're going to go to a few verses, verse 22, 23, 24, 10th chapter of Hebrews. But I want to give you a title, which is really fascinating. The title is, What Would You Have Me To Do? There's probably not one single one of us that are in here that we haven't at one time or another prayed to God and asked God that question. God, if you just have something for me to do, tell me what it is. Where would you have me to go? What would you have me to do? How would you have me to act? What would you have me to say? Lord, where am I? What is it you want from me? What would you have me to do? 
is a common question. And then when we don't hear an answer, we give up on God and say he doesn't care. Well, I'll just do whatever I want to do. When in fact, God says, why would I tell you? I've already given you a book on telling you how to do it. Why don't you just read the manual? We don't do that. So today, the title of the message is really kind of cool. I'm going to read these verses to you. Then I'm going to come back and explain why it's that message and that, why it's that title. Verse number 22 says, Let us draw near with a true heart, full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from the evil conscience of our bodies, washed with pure water. Verse 23, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised, I love this word, is faithful. Verse 24, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. At the beginning of each one of these verses that I just read, there's this wonderful two words that say, let us. Let us, number one, if you will, draw near. Let us stand fast. Let us consider one another. If we were to take the words, let us, now listen to this, listen, 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 and translate them for us to understand, the translation is this. This is what we should do. So the title of the message is, God, what would you have me to do? And here is what we should do. Sometimes the word of God is so incredibly simple that people don't want to follow it because it's not complex enough. Can I just say this to you? The whole word of God is so magnificently tight and works together, but it's very simple. God made it simple so it's a level playing field for everybody. Because if it wasn't a level playing field for everybody, then only the intellectual would be saved and get right with God. But some of us that are in this room, you know, we're just kind of common folk and we need really to have just basics and some simplicity. And then when we hear about how simple it really is, we go, oh no, it's got to be more complex than that. And it isn't. It's a very simple thing that he's describing. He describes three things that we should do. Draw near. We should, we should be a people that stand fast. We should be a people who consider others. And really, can I just say this to you? The entire gospel is wrapped up in that. There's different facets of it, different ways to go, different ways of looking at it, but really the entire gospel is wrapped up in those three things, if you really want. Jesus was approached by a young man and says, what should I do to inherit heaven? And Jesus said, love God with all of your heart, and all of your soul. That's that drawing near, holding fast. And then he said, love your neighbors as yourself. That's, if you will, the last part of this, which is consider one another. Different ways of saying it, but really saying the same thing. It's really kind of neat. So today, if you don't do anything else, listen closely and put your heart on the things of God, because God's presenting something to you so simple today that if you miss it, let me say it again, if you miss it, it's your fault, because it's not so deep you can't get it, and it's not so deep you can't adhere to it, and it's not so deep that you can't do it. Are you following me? Let's take a look at this, if you will. Number, verse number 22. Let us draw near. The bottom line on verse number 22, let us draw near. This is everything. Let me explain what I mean. Did you know that during the day you draw near to a lot of things? And oftentimes, we draw near to God very little of the time. We work at drawing near to our family. We work at drawing near to our spouse. We work at drawing near to our jobs. We work at drawing near to our giftings. We work at drawing near to our education. We work at drawing near to society and social system. We work at drawing near to our relatives. We work at drawing near to our neighbors. We're always working at drawing near to something when in fact the most important is drawing near to God. Because without us being near to God, we're going to miss everything else anyway. And we put the cart before the horse. 
And by the way, I might say this to you. In order to draw near to God, you're going to have to understand that you have a vicious enemy trying to stop you. No, I'm not talking about the devil. In fact, let me tell you about my enemy. I have a person. I, I, I never thought I'd ever tell you this, but there's a person that stops me from drawing near to God. This person is, is vicious and mean. This vicious doesn't care about God. This person wants me to follow something else other than God. There's always something being presented in my life that keeps me from drawing near to God. This person is absolutely ugly. And this person is me. The hardest person I have ever dealt with in my life is not you or anyone else. It's not Deborah. It's me. There's always something that comes up that takes me away from drawing near to God. We live in a society full of entertainment. I mean, you can go to the Dodger game, you can go to the Angel game, you can go to the boxing matches, you can go to the Honda Center, you can go to the sports activities, the soccer's here. Today there's a field going on, there's water polo there, there's track meets here. There's the mountains, there's the ocean, there's Disneyland, there's Knott's Berry Farm. Come on, you've got to be kidding me. And while you're at it, throw in the desert, play some tennis. There's always something my flesh wants that keeps me from drawing near to God. And here's what I, what I have to do. I have to learn how to practice. Are you listening? Let me say it one more time so you don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I have to learn how to practice drawing near to God. It's not just something I do on Sunday. Stop thinking about how pathetic that is. I go to church. That's how I draw near. How pathetic is that? I don't know how many hours there are in a week. What, 177 or 67 or 76? 100 hours a week and we draw near to God. One hour a week? How pathetic is that? And yet at the same time, we'll, we'll re visit the refrigerator more times than we'll visit God. I certainly guarantee you spend more time on the potty than you do in these seats. Come on, let's be honest with each other. And drawing near to God is uncomfortable to my flesh, but is profitable to my spirit, my future, and my destiny. And I have to fight to practice telling my flesh to shut up. You know who else had that problem? Paul the Apostle. He's the writer of two-thirds of the New Testament. Two-thirds, can you imagine that? Did you know that more people read Paul the Apostle's writings in one day than all the literature on the planet combined? And yet he had a problem. In Romans, the seventh chapter, he makes a statement. I wish that I could do this, but I don't do this. There's something that stops me from doing what I know to do. And then he goes on and says, oh, wicked man that I am, who will deliver me? In other words, my flesh has gotten in the way, stopped me from doing what I know to do. And then he says, Jesus Christ. Chapter number eight, verse number one, he says, there's no condemnation to those that walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. But we live in the flesh that keeps us from drawing near to God. The problem with that is what James says in the fourth chapter, verse number eight. Let me pop it up for you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Notice who draws near first. Wait a minute. I need God, you say. I want God near me because when he's near me is his presence. Where there's his presence, there's his power. Where there's his power, there's his peace. Where there's his peace, there's his, if you will, his, his uh, prestige, his, his, his privilege and his pleasure. I need his presence. I need to draw near. First thing he says, you draw near first. But you're going to have to draw near. But there's something stopping me. It's oftentimes my flesh that keeps me from drawing near to God. It's in the nearness to God that I get the answers to prayer. It's in the nearness to God that I have the confidence to keep going when the world is dumping on us. 
It's in the nearness to God that I find myself strong to make wise decisions, hearing something that I don't really hear, but I just know that I know that I know that I got the right directions to do what God would have me to do. It's in the nearness of God that life becomes real. And yet it's the very thing we do not practice doing and we give God a token hour every now and then. Come on, you know I'm talking the truth. So I thought I'd, instead of telling you about how important it is to draw near to God, and you'd see that, I thought I'd show you how to draw near. Quickly, three things, there's probably 40 things, but God showed me three things in the scripture about how God gets near to us if we do something with him. All found in Psalms, so you want to get your Bible and go with me to Psalms. Here's the first thing, how to draw near to God. Number one, maintain dependency. I need him to exist. I mean, the bottom line, without him, there's no air. Without him, there's no future. Without him, there's no direction. Without him, I can't make it. Without him, I'm a lousy father. Without him, I'm a lousy husband. Without him, I'm a lousy pastor. Without him, I have nothing. Everything I do, everything I say, every place I'll ever go, it's all about not me, him. And without that attitude, my friends, I've got to be dependent on him. It's a humility. It's an attitude that says, God, I need you. Paul had that same thing. He says, all that I say is not me that says it. But I say it because God has blessed me to say it. And sometimes we have an attitude because we're so smart, we're so clever, we're so talented, or we're so gifted that we forget about where it all came from and how we exist because of him. This is really not about how smart and clever not about how many doors are open and not open that you think you open and God, did. he opens doors that no man can open and closes doors no man can close. And maintaining this dependency day in and day out keeps you humble in your heart. I love what it says in the word of God in Psalms, so I'll just pop it up for you. The 34th chapter and verse number 18 says it like this. The Lord is near. I love the word near. We're talking about near. We're talking about getting near to God. Let us draw near. The Lord is near to those with a broken heart. Someone who says, Lord, I can't make it without you. This is the day. Recently, I just lost 15 pounds. I couldn't lose any weight. I was stuck at my age. It's really hard to lose weight. I was exercising every day and cutting down my food, but the weight wouldn't come off until I invited the Holy Spirit to help me lose weight. And I said to the Holy Spirit, I said, you're here to comfort me. I'm not comfortable in these fat, 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 fat clothes. I need to get back down to the, at least the fat clothes. And I need you to help me. Now the father gets pleasure over the prosperity of his servants, and I'm a servant. So let's bring some pleasure today to the father. I could do all things through Christ that strengthens me. So help me, Holy Spirit, to shut my mouth. That was 15 pounds ago. And I got another 30 to go. By the next time you see me, mm, 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 mm. there's no way I'll ever be chiseled, but I'll be the skinniest flabby old man you ever saw. <laughs> God's looking for somebody who's dependent on him, and you draw close to God by being dependent. Never forget that. Number two, how to draw close to God. Keep him in the forefront. Now, I didn't mean keep him alongside. See, somebody have God alongside. Everywhere I go, God goes, he's with me. He's in the driver's seat with me. No, no. Can I tell you something? Stop putting God in the driver's seat with you. Let him drive. Some people have God with them. Don't have God with them. Don't have God behind you. 
I got God behind me. Don't ever have God behind you. Have God in front of you. You know why? Because when he's in the forefront, everything you do, every place you ever go, whatever you say, you got to go through him to get there. Therefore, you won't make mistakes if you have to go through him to get there. <laughs> Is anybody listening? And here's David. David writes in Psalms. And listen, David was the first king, actually not first king, but the second king, but he was the first king that ever really trusted God with all of his heart. In the bloodline of David comes the Messiah, our Jesus. Now watch this. He was the greatest king Israel has ever known, double the size of of, of uh, Israel. He, he doubled the economy and brought prosperity to the land. And he had this amazing relationship with God. And the Bible talks about David a whole lot in Scripture. And I figure anybody that's talked about that much in Scripture, listen to this. Something is something about him that makes him very special to God. And he writes, and as he writes, he writes these verses that are so powerful in the 16th chapter of Psalms, verse number 8. Watch this. I have set the Lord always before me. Not behind me, not next to me. See, some of you have him behind you. Some of you have him next to you. But in order to go through him to get to where you need to go, he needs to be out in front. Now watch this. You forgot the words. Look at it again. I have set the Lord always. It was him who put God first. It was him that brought God to the forefront. It was him that was used mightily by God. God protected him all the way around, all because he set God first, forefront, out in front. Anything I go, any place I do, anything I ever say, yes, it's humility. But guess what? At the same time, I can't do that if God's behind me or just next to me or just with me. I need to have God in front of me so that I'm stopped by him. I'm guided by him. I'm directed by him in everything I do. And you can do that. Because it's so important for us. I have set the Lord always before me. Put him in the forefront. Number three, on how to draw near to God. Number three, cry out for him. A lot of times we're so conservative, we never cry out, especially us men. This morning I was listening to Debbie, she's not in this service right now. And I heard her while I was getting dressed in the other room, crying out loudly, crying out. I love that. I used to hear it when I was a young man, when our kids were all screwed up. She, it wasn't me, I was snoring. She was in there crying out. Sometimes us men need to get out of ourselves and we need to cry out. We can cry out in prayer. We can cry out in worship. Sometimes we just need to cry out, God, help me. The Bible says when a man cries out to God, God gets near that man. In Psalms, if you will, the 145th chapter of Psalms, verse 18, 145, verse 18 says, The Lord is near to all who call upon him and call upon him in truth. We need to cry out. So today, I'm sure there's 40 things you can do, but a real simple things to draw near to God. Let us draw near to God, because God, what would you have us to do? Simple things. Maintain dependency. Be humble before the Lord. Keep him in the forefront of your life, and don't forget to cry out to him. Just cry out to him. It's okay for the kids to hear you shouting to God. It's okay for your wife to hear you shouting to the Lord. It's okay for you to cry out to God. Sometimes we just don't do that. We're so conservative. And we don't need to be. I find the ones that cried the loudest, like blind, blind Bartimaeus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Shut him up. Jesus comes, touches him, and heals him. Sometimes we need just to, the woman with the issue of blood didn't stay quiet. Touched the hem of his garden gar, garment. She had to crawl on the dirt to get to him. She was the one that was crying out with her worship and got healed after 12 years of being sick. 
My friends, we forget that. Let's go back, if you will, to Hebrews 10, chapter, verse 22, let us draw near. I like verse 23. In verse 23, let us hold fast. Let me just quickly tell you about this. This is a quick one. Is that okay? Anything that doesn't hold fast is no good and is not fastened. Anything that can fail is no good. Stop thinking about it in your marriage. Let's say you were going to get married. You went to this guy and you said, I'm going to marry you. And he said to you, well, you never know if I'm going to be there or not. Any day I could never show up again. I'm going to be gone. And you think, oh, yes, let's get married so you can walk out on me. Not a chance. No one's that stupid and no one gets married. They may walk out on you later on, but at first they never told you that. Anything that's not fast is broken. And anything that's broken is no good. And God knows us humans. And we've got to come to a place where it says that we hold fast as the character of our love. We love God so much. And we know so much about God, there's nothing going to sway us. And may I say this to you? Listen closely to what I'm about to say to you. In society, the social systems that we live in, there's going to be a lot of things that are contrary to the word of God. Because society says it's good. Society says it's acceptable. The Supreme Court says it's all right. Doesn't make it good and doesn't make it acceptable and doesn't make it right. And you're going to have to hold on to what you know. And you only get to know three things about your Savior. His death, his burial, and his resurrection. And if you believe that, I don't give a flip what the world has to say. You're not going to move me. Doesn't matter whatsoever. I'm holding fast to the death, burial, and resurrection of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I'm not going to let go no matter how many people say I'm wrong. No matter what they say. No matter what they think they're proving. I'm here to tell you Jesus is Lord and I'm sinking my life. And I'm going to be dependently hold fast to it. I love science fiction movies. I don't care. If you write me emails. I just throw them out anyway. I love Star Trek and Star Wars and all that stuff. You know, when you go to the theater, there's a big tall guy sitting in the middle with a white helmet on. That's me. I'm kidding for you, those of you that are here for the first time. I'm kidding. I've gone that far. I mean, Princess Leah's not in here right now, but no, no, I'm playing with you. I'm playing with you. Here's my point. I don't give a flip if 10,000 aliens in silver saucers land in New York City. It will not change my faith in Jesus Christ. Wait a minute. You say, well, what about that? What I know is what God said. He didn't tell me everything about the universe. And I don't give a flip about that. And can I just tell you the truth? Have you been to New York lately? They've already landed there. <laughs> New York doesn't even know it yet. You get on one of those subways, you're saying, oh, my, my, my. What I'm saying is this. Listen to what I'm saying to you. You're not getting me off. But what men say, only what God says is important. And I'm not moving even if it doesn't make sense to me. Because I'm not let in on anything much past his death, burial, and his resurrection. And he is God Almighty. Come on, somebody. And that's called being steadfast. Go with me to Hebrews, if you will. The 10th chapter, verse number 24, will conclude with this. I love this one. Verse 24 says, let us consider one another. If God loves people. Oh, let me say it again. And this is the hardest thing in the world to imagine. If God loves people, then we ought to love what God loves. 
Now, I have the hardest time with this because I think a lot of people are idiots. How about you? And I'm a man, and sometimes when you buzz by me on the freeway, and you've got one of those little cars go, and they go really fast, they almost take out your fast bumpers. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Huh? And you would just love to get in your car and chase after them, drag them out of their car. And if I was younger, oh my goodness, thank God I got old. I would just like to smack them and then repent later. But Jesus wants me to love who he loves. Now, wait a minute. And now he says, love one another, consider one another. But God, we're all a bunch of idiots. We all do stupid things. We all make mistakes. We're all screw-ups. We all think differently. And then God says, yes, but there's different giftings. And they need you and you need them to complete the body of Christ. And as weird as it is for them, it's weird for you, but all of you together make one. Romans, the 12th chapter. And we need to consider and love one another. If God loves people, we need to get past the frailty, the foolishness, the goofiness of people and say, if God loves them, I'm going to love them too. And that's what he's talking about. Remember the little boy comes to Jesus, the man comes to Jesus, what should I do to inherit eternal life? He says, love your God all your heart and all your soul and love your neighbor as yourself. All wrapped up in simple gospel. So here we are today. Now listen to what it says in Philippians. Just pop up Philippians for me. Hello back there. Thank you. Let each of you look not out for, only for his own interests, but also for the interest of others. When you come to church, did you know this is not just about you? It's about others. And a church that gathers together considers others. And that's why you bring your tithe and your offering. We pull it together and we send it to missionaries. We help feed a half a million people a year. We're in all the hospitals and all the prisons. Yesterday, there were 14 hospitals with services going on from the rock, just in our area. All of which, it's all because, here's why. We don't bring our tithe into the house of God because it's a thing to do. We do it because we love others and want to see them reached for Jesus. So three things today on, oh God, what shall we do? What would you have me to do? Which was the title. Number one, draw near, practice it. Number two, stand fast. No matter what comes your way, you're not going to be moved. And there's stuff coming your way, I promise you. Number three, consider others. Walk in the love that God has for others. If God spoke to you today, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Will you do that? Isn't God good? Real quick, I want to make sure everybody's all right before you leave. Nothing could be worse than you coming in to the house of God, listening to the word like you did, singing songs, clapping your hands, even getting on your knees in front, walking out of here. Now watch this, watch this. And your heart stops. Bang! You die and you open your eyes in hell. Nothing could be worse. Did you know the Bible says that you should check yourself out from time to time? That's what the Bible says. Make sure you're right with God. So I'm gonna ask you a question. Answer it in your heart. Nobody will know but you and God. Here's the question. If, you're, if you were to die in the next few minutes, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Go ahead, nobody will know but you and God. Answer the question. Here's some of your answers. Some of you said, I think I would go to heaven. There's nowhere in the Bible that says you could think your way into heaven. Like you're a positive thinker, you get to go to heaven. It's not in the Bible. Some of you said, I, I, Pastor, I hope, I, I hope if I died, I'd go to heaven. I hope I'd make it, man. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say because you can hope your way into heaven, you get to go to heaven. You're not going to make it. Just not going to make it. Someone needs to love you enough, respect you enough, honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Some of you said, well, I'm going to go to heaven because my mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. You know, they put a cross or a St. Christopher around my neck. 
You know, they took me to catechism class or Sabbath school class. And uh, I, I, I did all that when I was a kid. And I've always thought of myself as a Christian. First of all, nowhere in the Bible says your mom and dad take you to those classes, put a cross around your neck, and take you to catechism or Sunday school class, Sabbath school class, makes you a Christian. Nowhere, not in the Bible. You're not going to make it if you think that's going to get you to heaven. Isn't that interesting? Some of you said, well, I love God a lot. I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does, nowhere, it's not in the Bible. You'd think it would be. I would have thought so too. But nowhere in the Bible said because you love God, you get to go to heaven. Nowhere, it's not in the Bible. Not going to make it. Jesus, listen to me now. Jesus comes in John 3rd chapter and he says these words. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. Then he comes to a guy in John 3rd chapter by the name of Nicodemus. And it's recorded in scripture for a reason for thousands of years. So you and I can look into this and see the mystery and the secrets that are in there. Why Nicodemus? Here's Nicodemus. Jesus comes to him and says these words. Nicodemus, you must be born again. Why Nicodemus? Nicodemus was better than all of us, probably in his lifestyle. He was a, stop and think about it, a keeper of the law, memorized the scripture, quoted the scripture, debated the scripture, sang the scripture. How many of you have done that? Sang the scripture, was ahead of his church, the synagogue, fed the poor in his community. Wow, I would have thought, wouldn't you, that Jesus would have come, patted him on the back and said, hey, Nicodemus, man, you have done so good. You're going to love heaven. Heaven's waiting for you. But he doesn't. He says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, Hollywood's made a crazy thing out of born again. People are nuts, fanatics, and weirdos, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. Born again. Let me explain what it means so you can understand. If you must be that way to get to heaven, let me tell you what it means. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, here's what God's after. All of your heart and all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always has been, it always will be, all or nothing. God forgive us in American churches, we've watered that down for 250 years. But it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ, and I'll prove it to you right now. The last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, you've heard of it. Jesus is speaking, he says, I'm coming again. And then he makes this statement. When I come, I better find you hot, or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. <laughs> what a blunt, rude, crude statement out of the mouth of Jesus. Sometimes we think Jesus never said anything except sweet stuff. Boy, he's in his face. He says, if you're lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. What's lukewarm? Let's investigate. Lukewarm is somebody who's a little in, a little out. It's lukewarm, little up, little down. Token prayer. Occasional church attendance, you know, that's, that's lukewarm. Here's lukewarm. You're not against God. Watch this, watch this, watch this. But you're not wholehearted for God. Now watch this. Here's lukewarm. God is something in your life, but he's not your everything. And by the way, he'll never become something until you make him everything. And that's what this is all about. And notice how I said you have to give God all of your heart, you have to give God all of your life because it's an all or nothing relationship. And can I just say it like this? He's after that. Could he take it from you? But he doesn't. Could he create a billion robots that look just like you, talk like you, have the same DNA as yours? Yes. Could he have the same fingerprints as yours? Yes. A billion of them. And all of them could worship God. He doesn't. He created you a unique vessel, person, all by yourself, with rights and choices. And he doesn't want somebody in heaven unless somebody wants to be in heaven and wants to choose him. And today is your day of salvation. And somebody needs to tell you the truth. No longer walk in compromise. No longer walk in one foot in and one foot out but giving God all of your heart and giving God all of your life. You say, Pastor Jim, well, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said if, with these words, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But if you deny me, I'll, I'll deny you. I'm a man. So in a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. It'll sound like this. One, two, 
three, and I'll pop my hands here. I go, bang, when you hear that sound, bang, your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. What you're saying, here's what it is. Listen, what you're saying by the raising of your hand, hear me now, is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life. See, I already know you know who he is or you wouldn't be here. I already know you celebrate Christmas and Easter or you wouldn't be here. I know you know who Jesus is. It's not about what you have in your head. Even the devil knows who he is. He's not going to heaven. So it's not about head knowledge. It's about what you've done with all of your heart. Have you given him all of your heart? Have you given him all of your life? In a moment, I'm going to count, pop my hands together. You get your hand up, put it right back down. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on, Pastor Jim. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. The people I came with will see me. People behind me will see me. I'll feel funny. Yep, you will. Get over it. It's better to feel funny for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people see instead of what God sees. Come on, no one's that dumb, but the devil's trying to tell you not to do it. And today it's your day of salvation. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? Get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your heart, get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your life, get ready to put your hand up. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, make sure. Get ready to put your hand up. Let's get right with God. Today is a divine appointment you have with God. Don't miss this. Today is your day of salvation. I'm counting to three. I've done my job. I've told you the truth and I've loved you enough to not play games, but to tell you like it is. Today is your day. All across this auditorium, are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Thank you. Back over on this side, fifteen. I already think I already counted them. Fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Thank you. Back over here, seventeen. Thank you. Eighteen. Thank you. God bless you. There's nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. 23. Thank you. Anybody else? 23. There's 23. Where are you? 24. You didn't. There you are. 24. Where are you? 25. Anybody else? You know you need to get your hand up. Just get your hand up. There's 24. I know there's 20. Can you just feel 25? Where are you? Okay. Let's jump over 20. There's 25. We're 26. Good. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? They're pointing this way. I already got him. I already got him. I already got him. Isn't God good? 26 people, let's give the Lord a great big hand. Okay. <laughs> okay, here's what I want you to do. I don't want anybody to leave. I want everybody, that's 26 of you that raised your hand, get your hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff. All 26 of you, I want you to get out of your seat, get in the aisle, bring a friend if you need to, get in the, right down here in front. Listen, listen, listen. If you cannot walk a safe aisle for Jesus, You'll never live in a dirty world for him. So get out of your seat and come. And anybody that didn't raise their hand, you can come too. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. Come on. They're still coming. <laughs> oh, they're still coming. Come on home. And God, good. All of you in front, thank God you've come. I'm excited about this. This is the best day of the rest of your life. 
Today, I want to point out something. I want you to look to your left, see this guy waving at you. His name is Pastor Joel. No weird stuff goes on, I promise you. You know how you go to church, you wonder if they're weird. Only when Pastor Dan is preaching is it weird. And he's over there in the front row. So we're, we're cool. So here's, here's the deal. Joe, Pastor Joel is going to do something. He's going to, number one, lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Number two, he's going to give you some free stuff. We love free around here. Number three, that'll tell you what to do next. Number three, he's going to invite you to come and be part of a, an organization we have that'll help you get strong called Spiritual Personal Trainers. It's a friend. We give friends away. Meet you before church service, pray for you, encourage you, not let you go back, fall through the cracks. Nothing can be worse than you walking forward today and then decide, I'm going to do nothing about walking forward. I'll just go on living the same life. Let us help you Go on with Jesus strong. Let us help you get strong. You need a family, we're your family. You need a pastor, I'm putting in my application. And I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell you the truth. I'll humble myself always and I'll fight for you as we have for years. So this is a good church and a healthy church. If you don't have one, come on, hook up and let's go because there's great things ahead of you. Make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right over that way. Big hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.